So yes, do you uh, believe in the right time? Do you believe in God's timing? And if so, then I ask you, do you believe that you have perhaps come to your place or your position, the season of your life for such a time as this? For such a time as this. You see, of course, this is one of the familiar questions or verses from the book of Esther. The story that we'll use today as we continue in this sermon series, Waiting on the World to Change. Yes, we're looking at, we're looking at four different biblical characters in the way that they changed their immediate world. We've seen Abraham's obedience. Last week was Philip's witness. And today... We see that regardless of how she ascended to her position, Queen Esther became a change agent for herself, for her people, and for the entire world. If you remember the story, Queen Esther is a Jewish girl who becomes queen of the entire Persian Empire. And that's because Queen Vesti refuses to appear before King Xerxes. He's having a party with his friends and he wants to show her off. And she's like, I can't stand it anymore. And so she is banished from the empire, from her position, from her throne. And then an empire-wide search begins for a new queen, sort of like Star Search or American Idol, but this was a beauty pageant version. Well, Esther is ultimately chosen. Well, meanwhile in the story, you have Mordecai, who is her older cousin, who actually raised her. He's a government official that overhears an assassination plot to kill the king. He tells Esther, who then informs the king. Well, then you have Haman, who, who's basically a hater in the story, right? Haman is second in command as the prime minister. Well, he is in rage because Mordecai has refused to bow down to him in reference or reverence. So then Haman then tricks the king into, uh, into making a decree that condemns all the Jews to death. Well, here in chapter 4, word reaches Queen Esther that Mordecai is distraught, and so she sends someone to find out why. He then responds, not through text, but through a messenger, (laughs) and instructs her to go into the king's presence to beg for mercy and plead with the king for her people. And so then she responds by reminding him that anyone who approaches the king without being summoned may be put to death. We pick up in verse 12. Take a listen. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows? but that you have come to royal position for such a time as this. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go, gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went away and carried out all of Esther's instructions. You see, it's through these words today, this story, that we are encouraged to follow Queen Esther's instructions, to follow her footsteps, if you will, to follow her courage, Esther's courage. Let's pray. Christian and Holy God, we thank you and praise you for your Holy Spirit in this place and in our lives. We pray, Lord, that your spirit would remain in a mighty way as your word is given and received. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Do you or do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape? You see, basically, Mordecai here is, is calling Esther out, right? He, along with some biblical commentators, they attribute her hesitation to to being selfish or even a coward. But if we really understand the circumstances and the story, we can't blame her. 
I mean, four reasons. One, she already knows what happened to Vesti for disobeying. Two, she knows that it's against the law and that she'd be risking her life. I mean, how often do we go about our day purposely doing something that we know is risking our lives? Three, we know that she's not the only one or the first one to try to escape God's call. I mean, remember Moses in Exodus 4, and we'll see his story next week. Exodus 4, 10 through 13, he says, Pardon your servant, Lord. I've, I've never been eloquent, and I'm slow to speech and tongue. The Lord said, Go. I will, speak, I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. But then Moses says, but Pardon me, Lord. Uh, just, just please send someone else. You ever get to that point? Just, just, I am not the right. Lord, just please send someone else. Well, it's the same with Barak in Judges 4, 8. The same with Jeremiah in chapter 1, verse 6 of his book. It's the same with Jonah in chapter 1 of that book. You see, yes, we know that she's not the first or the only one to try to escape God's call. And then number four, we know that this life was imposed on Queen Esther. There she was living her life in her daily routines, and then all of a sudden the trumpets sound, and they start this empire-wide search. This was imposed upon her. I mean, you ever been there to where you're going about your business, going about your daily routine, and then the circumstances of life or the decisions, the behavior, the actions of someone else impacts you? You see, Carol was driving on the interstate recently, and she was approaching an overpass. Well, as soon as she reached the overpass, boom, she heard this loud crack. Of course, it startled her, and then as she looked up, she saw spider web in the glass sunroof above her. And as she came out the other side, she saw in her rearview mirror two teenage boys on the top of the overpass dropping rocks on cars as they passed. So, of course, she was distraught. She calls me. She, she's frantic a little bit. But at the same time, we were thankful that it wasn't worse, right? I mean, literally, there in that moment, not only was the car impacted, but she was impacted. And then as we had to deal with the aftermath, taking the car in to have it, repl- you know, rent a, rent a car and getting the sunroof, sometimes we're just going about our day, going about our life, and then all of a sudden, the decisions of others impact us. You see, that's the case here with all of these biblical characters. While they were called to impact the world, the case is, or the truth is, that the world was also impacting them. And again, we'll see that next week with Moses and how his life started out. You ever been there to where you're just minding your own, and then all of a sudden, that's what's happening here. This was imposed. This was dropped on Queen Esther. This was forced upon her. And so, yes, for these reasons, we can't blame her for being a little hesitant or trying to escape. And again, it's not just her, but it's us as well. I mean, you ever try to escape something or someone? Maybe avoiding someone in the grocery store, trying to escape out of a relationship, trying to avoid traffic or a project at work, a deadline or a job in itself. Well, escaping's not always negative. Remember a long time ago, dodgeball, tag, hide and seek. Well, nowadays they have these escape rooms where you gather some friends, four, five, six, seven of you, and then you are locked inside of a themed room and you are given this story, this scenario, and the, together you all are trying to find the solution. And so you're trying to figure out all these clues and these puzzles, and one clue leads to another. And within 60 minutes, you all are trying to escape the room together. Yet sometimes we try to escape when it's all fun and games. Well, that's not the case here. You see, here when Mordecai says it, when he says escape, it's actually a word being translated from malat, malat meaning to save one's self, to escape to safety, to escape your calling, your purpose, your responsibility. You ever tried to do that? You ever tried to malat, to escape to safety or comfort, meaning contentment and complacency in your faith? Have you ever tried to malat, you ever tried to escape your calling, your purpose, your responsibility? You see, the hope here for Mordecai is that Esther does not escape this moment, her calling. 
And so he goes a step further. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your family's father's family will perish. You see, here Mordecai warns Esther. He almost even threatens her, right? Don't think that you're going to escape just because you're in the palace because that's where the danger comes from. That's where the danger is. It's in the palace. And it won't be just you that will perish, but your family, our family also. But that'll only happen if you remain silent. You see, Mordecai wants her to, Mordecai wants her to speak up. He wants her to speak out. He wants her to speak to the king. And it's kind of ironic because he was the one that told her back in chapter 2 to remain silent, to keep her identity a secret. And so five years have passed since chapter 2, and she has done that the whole time. Queen Esther has kept silent. I mean, you ever have to keep silent? I mean, imagine this here, right? Having to keep your identity, your your nationality, your family, your heritage a secret. You ever had to remain silent for a long period of time? When I was a camp counselor at Warren Willis Youth Camp, and we would have themed days or themed weeks. Well, one of the favorites was our, uh, superhero week. And so some of the counselors we, would dress up as well-known heroes, Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, X-Men or Marvel or Avengers, right? Well, some would actually create their own superhero. And there was one particular counselor that created, uh, or he became the silent caper. And still to this day, we're not sure if the silent caper was a good guy or a bad guy, if he was a hero or, or a villain. You see, he would dress in all black, black slacks, a black shirt, and he would have like a, a long sleeve uh, cape, almost like a vampire cape. He wore a black hat with a full brim all the way around in dark black shades. And his only superpower was he was silent. He was sneaky. He couldn't make any noise, any sound. Well, over time, he became a fan favorite amongst the campers and, and the counselors and the adult volunteers. And so they would ask, where's Silent Caper? And so he would begin to make appearances outside of Superhero Week. Summer after summer, and people would say, have we seen the silent caper this summer? And then next thing you know, he would appear, right? But the thing about the silent caper is he would not talk all day long. Picture being a counselor amongst campers, and he simply would not talk. And so the only way that you could communicate with him was the fact that he would use hand gestures and some sign language, um, almost like charades. And so folks over time, you know, they'd be excited to see the silent caper. They'd be, he'd be excited to, to see them. And he'd say, you know, long time no see. Long time no see. All day long, you had to try to decipher what he was trying to say. Well, here you see silent means much more than not speaking. It's karash, karash. And it means to be or to keep silent, but it also means to take no actions, to make no moves. I mean, that was the only way he could communicate was by making moves. But here, it means more than that. Mordecai is saying, if you remain silent, if you make no moves, if you take no action, we will perish. But he throws in this but. We will perish, but relief and deliverance will arise from another place. And here, the reference to another place is a reference to God. You see, that's important for us to understand because God's not mentioned at all in the entire book of Esther. You see, this is the closest thing to referring to God's power and God's presence in their lives. And so the thought, the the assumption is that God is working behind the scenes. No, no, no. You see, God doesn't remain silent. Karash, making no moves, taking no action. God is always making moves and taking action. But oftentimes, it's through us. And so, yes, when we speak up, when we speak out, when we speak about the things of God, God is working and not remaining silent. Last week, I told you that any time we're in a drive-thru, our boys can't remain silent, right? They witness. First window, second window, thank you, God loves or Jesus loves you, have a nice day. 
well, how about we're in the drive-thru? And they start into, the, into their normal spiel, and Isaiah starts laughing. And Gavin, as the older brother, I mean, you, you know, as an older sibling, any time you can get on to your younger sibling, you take that, that opportunity, right? Gavin, he could remain silent. In the moment, he said, don't laugh. That's Jesus' love. Respect it. Respect it. <laughs> well, you see, when it comes to saying and doing what's right, living godly for God's purposes, we cannot remain silent. You see, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in a 1968 speech reflecting on the civil rights movement, he says, in the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. You see, doing right for him meant seeking equality, reconciliation, harmony, and peace. For him, that was Jesus' love, Jesus' justice, and we should respect it. We should pursue it. We should seek it. We should live it out. Well, you see, who knows if Dr. King had any of those Moses-like tendencies, but I thank God that he didn't, that he didn't try to escape his calling or remain silent. Of course, God could have and God would have raised up someone else, but God didn't have to, nor did God have to hear either. For Mordecai continues, and who knows that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. You see here, finally, Mordecai tries a different approach, one that is more positive, more powerful, more personal, and more providential. Yes, his words provide a a godly purpose to all that's happened to Queen Esther. Yes, he said, maybe, just maybe you won that pageant and ascended to the throne for such a time as this. And so it sparks a change in her. It sparks action in her. Go, she says, gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, and even though it is against the law, if I perish, I perish. You see, now she has changed. She is, she is ready for action. She is ready to assume this responsibility. She's now fasting and trusting in God. She now uh, fully identifies with her Jewish people. She now acts like a queen with leadership and determination and courage. She now looks at the situation completely different. Yes, though the world uh, impacted her, though this was imposed upon her, now she sees it in a different perspective that I can use this to impact and change the world. We all need to be a little more like Queen Esther and have courage. Psychologist Dr. Stephen Diamond says, courage is a kind of strength, power, or resolve to meet a daunting circumstance head on. We need courage whenever we confront a difficult, dangerous, or disheartening situation. You see, as you may know, courage is synonymous with bravery and actually comes from the French root cour, and it means heart. And so that's why we refer to people that have a lot of bravery as having a lot of heart. Well, you see, it's not just those that are outwardly brave, like our first responders or military. All of us. It's required for all of us. Courage is, requir- is required from everyone every day for just about everything. You see, life itself takes courage. Loving others takes courage. Fulfilling commitment takes courage. Raising children takes courage. Yes, surviving abuse and tragedy and neglect, that takes courage. Well, fighting disease takes courage. Growing older takes courage. Facing the future takes courage. I want you to know this morning, church, that proclaiming Christ, that takes courage. Making a difference takes courage. Advocating takes courage. Seeking equality and reconciliation, peace and harmony, that takes courage. And just like we said in the membership vows, resisting evil and oppression and injustice, well, that takes courage. You see, living life, especially for Christ, that takes courage. Being a change agent in this world we live in, takes courage. It takes courage. Well, being this change agent means going to God, making a commitment, making a courageous choice, and then following through regardless of the circumstances. You see here, Esther places her, places her circumstances and her life in God's hands to be used by God at the right time and in the right place. 
And not because she's exceptional or extraordinary, but because she's faithful and courageous. Well, what about you? Are you or can you be courageous for God and God's kingdom? As we sing in the song, 2 Timothy 1.7, God didn't give us a spirit of or that is timid, but one that is powerful, loving, and self-controlled. Each one of us, each one of you can show courage this morning simply by serving. You don't have to change the whole world, just do one thing. You don't have to advocate for all of God's people. Start small and do at least one thing. You see, the world, yes, will continue to impact us. Our calling as Christians, as disciples, is then to figure out a way to impact the world. And I know some of you are looking at your watch. We're almost there. (laughs) This morning, you can can volunteer with adult discipleship. Um, You can serve as a small group leader, small group facilitator, Sunday school teacher, or you can join leadership team. You can volunteer with Angel Outreach to help with the Christmas project. You can volunteer in our children's ministries on Sundays, Wednesdays, the Vacation Bible School, or events like last night's Trunk or Treat. And we actually had some royalty there, not um, King Esther or Queen Esther or King Xerxes. We had the Burger King, he was there, um, <laughs> along with Wendy's and uh, Chick-fil-A Cow and Ronald McDonald. Anyways, <laughs> Congregational Care, you can volunteer there. People willing to make visits or make phone calls or write notes. You can be an um, ambassador to each of these sections here in the sanctuary. We need registered nurses to join faith community nursing and prayer partners. All of these come with training. You can volunteer in the food pantry and serve the community uh, second Thursday of every month. You can volunteer in our global missions only two hours a month. Uh, bringing congregational awareness, supporting and praying for our missionaries, their trips, their projects, their visits, and disaster relief. You can volunteer with the green team, those that are greeting um, our neighbors as they come on Sunday mornings. You can volunteer with Habitat and help build a family home. You can volunteer with our hospitality ministries and serve one night per month um, with, with a with the hospitality team, uh, with Wednesday night dinner. You can serve coffee on Sunday mornings with Sit and Sip. You can help prepare a meal with uh, Pinellas Hope monthly. And you can help start this new outreach, Healthy Start Coalition, joining the planning team or packing food bags to be distributed. You can make prayer shawls for our church members going through rough times or uh, chemotherapy hats. They meet monthly and instructions are provided. You can volunteer with Sacred Arts and join the choir, the bell choir, Second Sunday Singers. You can volunteer with UMW in our thrift store. And you can volunteer with youth, being a Sunday school, middle school teacher, youth leader on Sundays and Wednesdays or chaperones farm events. I could go on and on and on and on. There is life in this church, and you should be thankful unto God. But that life can be vital if all of us don't get involved. They say in most churches, average churches, that 20% of the people do 80% of the work, but I don't want us to be an average church. I don't want us to be an average church. Amen? Amen. So ask yourself three questions. What would have become of Queen Esther and her family without her courage at such a time? What will happen to our impact, our witness? What will happen to our neighbors if we don't serve? And then reflect on your life, your gifts, your passions, your circumstances, and ask, have I come to this place, this position, this season, for such a time as this? You see, if the silent caper were here this morning, and if he could talk, he would tell you that God is always working, that God is always making moves, taking actions, but it's usually through us. And because of that, that even if we could not say a word, our community should still see Jesus through us, through our gestures, our movements, in our actions. And the reason why I know he would tell you that is because I am the silent.